It is good to be with you again tonight, and we are here to study from the book of Acts. I hope you're having a good week. Things are going well here, and I hope to see you this coming Sunday, this coming Lord's Day, for worship at 9 or 11, and then also for Bible class at 10. So we still have the two services going on, and for our members, we really appreciate it. If you can sign up using the Sign Up Genius account, this would be a good time to do that, or right after class, or whenever you have your device open and ready to do that tonight, we would really appreciate that so we can kind of make plans, make sure we're kind of evenly divided, that everybody's not all coming to one service at once, but that really helps us. We appreciate that. So feel free to sign up now. And if you're a guest joining us tonight, if you don't have access to that, that's fine. Come along and we would love to see you this coming Sunday, if at all possible. So we're looking forward to seeing you Sunday at 9 or 11 for early or late worship and then for class at 10 in the middle. Uh, we do have a prayer request today. Um, Abe uh, wiped out on his moped earlier this morning, I think on his way to work. And uh, he's doing all right, I think headed home midday today. So uh, let's be praying for Abe as he recovers. As far as I know, nothing broken, just kind of removing some some gravel from his hands and that kind of thing. So be praying for Abe tonight. And then something I want to mention again on Sunday that I mentioned in the bulletin this past week uh, we have some new invitation cards for the congregation, Just Christians, and then a little introduction to the church, a picture of us worshiping on the inside there, and then the back side has God's plan of salvation with the contact information for the congregation as well as the updated times of services. So I know personally, as I've talked to people about the church over the past year or so, I can give them one of our old cards, but I always have to explain uh, don't come at those times on the card. We've changed, and obviously everything has been up in the air with COVID and everything, but uh, now we finally have that printed here, so we'll probably be at the 9, 10, 11 format for a little bit here. And we only printed 500 of these. We have most of these divided out into little packs of 10 and little Ziploc bags on the back uh, table under the coat rack at church. So on your way in on Sunday, I uh, hope you pick up one of those little baggies there and uh, keep that in a pocket or a purse or in your car or at your desk at work or wherever you're most likely to run into people that you may be interested in inviting to uh, learn more about the Lord. So hope you pick these up uh, this coming Sunday. We hope to use these and then we will make suggestions, we'll make corrections and update this and uh, make them even better next time. So uh, thank you for your help with that. Uh, tonight we are continuing with our study of the book of Acts, and Acts, of course, is just a history of the early church. Luke is part one, the life of Christ. Acts is part two, the beginning of the church and the, the history of the early church. So the activities of the apostles, the book of gospel action, as I think it's translated into uh, at least one guy we studied with uh, who was reading it in Chinese. So the book of gospel action, the acts of the apostles, or some of the acts of some of the apostles, maybe a little more accurate. So we focus on Peter, roughly the first one-third of the book, and then the last two-thirds are focused primarily on the missions of Paul and his missionary journey. So that's where we are. Um, up to this point in the book, we have uh, looked at the first 14 chapters, and so we're using the ABCs of Acts as something of a memory tool. So we had Ascension for chapter 1, the beginning of the church in chapter 2. The man who couldn't walk was carried and cured in chapter 3. We had the determined disciples who wouldn't stop preaching in chapter 4. In Acts 5, we had the empty jail, the first deacons, but always with the question mark there in Acts chapter 6. In Acts 7, we had Stephen, the great hero, and a record of his lengthy sermon on that occasion. In Acts 8, we had the eunuch asking, how can I? In Acts 9, I am Jesus. Acts 10, we had the journey to Joppa. In Acts 11, we had the reminder that the kingdom now includes Gentiles. And so the introduction of Cornelius and his baptism, he's uh, that's explained back to the church back home. In Acts 12, we had Peter liberated again. And so the second time Peter's let out of jail by an angel. And then in Acts 13, we had missionaries sent out. And then over the past two weeks, we've looked at Acts 14, where Paul and Barnabas make their way to Lystra. The people worship them as if they are gods, Zeus and Hermes. Uh, but Paul has to convince them that they are not gods, but men. So we're not gods. I'm not Zeus. I'm not Hermes. But we are just men. We are people like all of you. And eventually, Paul is beaten. He is left for dead. But he goes right back into the city before moving along. And we learned last week that on his way back home, Paul retraces his steps on that trip, at least for the part where he's up north in uh, what we would call today Turkey. And on his way back out, he appoints elders in every church. And since this takes place within a period of roughly three years from hearing the gospel to be appointed elders, it is possible for men to be qualified a little bit quicker 
than we might have previously imagined. At the end of Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas return to Antioch, and they report to the church in Antioch everything that God has done through them. Tonight we're moving into Acts chapter 15, where we come to the summary, Old Law Not Binding. Old Law Not Binding. And before we get to the text itself, I would just ask this. When people today are converted and come into the Lord's church from other religious groups, do they sometimes bring some of their denominational ideas along with them? Is there a time of adjustment? Is there a learning curve? Is there a time of maybe transition, maybe a little bit of a time of frustration? I think sometimes yes, and, and I can think of several examples. You probably can as well. Uh, if we were together, we could uh, do some good talking about this, I have a feeling, but uh, we might continue to refer to the preacher as pastor. That's one of those things that's kind of hard to break. It's one of those things that carries on from a lifetime in a denominational church where the preacher was the pastor or the reverend. So that's kind of one of those things that gets carried over and we've got to correct it and, and work through that. Uh, some might refer to the church building or the auditorium as being the sanctuary. That's one of those things that's kind of carried over, thinking that the building itself is a holy place. And we kind of uh, need to educate with that and be patient and work through it and teach and admonish. Or they might refer to the building itself as being the church. And I know, I, you know, we see on a, the news from time to time that a church has burned. Well, <laughs> not really. Okay, maybe a building was destroyed. There was a, a church building down in Tennessee destroyed in the floods. Well, the church itself didn't flood. Uh, the church's building did. That may be a minor thing, but that's just one of those things where people have misconceptions or they bring with them some baggage from the past. But I would also ask whether we can think specifically of any carryovers from the Old Testament. Some things that people may try to bring over from the old to the new without God's authority, without God's permission. And like you, I can think of several examples. The practice of tithing, uh, giving 10% as some kind of law or commandment. I know I've uh, heard a lot of religious people today talk about the importance of tithing. We've got to tithe. You've got to give God 10% and that kind of thing. And they just don't realize uh, that that's one of those commands that has not been carried over into the new covenant. But today, instead, we are to just give as we have prospered. So there is some percentage to it. It's uh, connected to how much we earn. Uh, but it's not given as 10% like it was under the old law. So that's one example of that. Uh, maybe the honoring of the Sabbath day, or maybe thinking that Sunday is the new Sabbath day, or maybe uh, the use of incense as an act of worship. Don't we see that from time to time in the religious world today? We'll, we'll bring over the use of incense as a religious practice. I'm not saying us in particular, but just in the denominational world in general. Uh, maybe the use of instruments in worship as a carryover from the Old Testament, not really understanding that we don't have God's permission. We don't have his authority to do that in the New Testament church. So again, many of these things have been carried over from the old to the new. And sometimes we need to educate, we need to correct, we need to clarify, we need to admonish, we need to build up. And this is something that we'll be looking at in Acts chapter 15. It's really as I understand it, the first real example of conflict or a disagreement on a, a church-wide basis within the early church. So it's a serious event that we're dealing with here. And our first paragraph tonight is Acts 15 verses 1 through 5. So let's look together then at Acts 15 verses 1 through 5. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses." 
Well, we need to remember that Paul and Barnabas are still in Antioch. That's roughly 400 miles, almost straight north of Jerusalem. Antioch is that congregation that was uh, made up of both Jews and Gentiles. This is the place where the disciples were first called Christians. And as we discussed a few weeks ago, when we got to that passage, they really, at this point, couldn't be called Jews anymore. Most people weren't looking at Christianity as a as a sect of Judaism anymore. Once enough people started obeying the gospel out of the Gentile world, they weren't really Jewish people. And so they were first called Christians up there in Antioch. And we know that Paul and Barnabas are up there reporting on their recent mission trip. The church in Antioch had sent them on what would later be known as Paul's first missionary journey. This is a trip where many people had obeyed the gospel. New congregations were established, as we just reviewed a couple minutes ago. Uh, elders were being appointed in those new churches. So a lot of amazing things were happening on that first missionary journey. And so as they report on those good things that had happened, certain men make their way down from Jerusalem. Now remember I said Antioch is 400 miles north, but we're not talking north, south, east, and west kind of up and down. Uh, but we're talking elevation. So elevation, not direction. They went down from Jerusalem. And these men started teaching that you cannot be saved without being circumcised first. And so these men are contradicting Paul. Uh, this is not something that Paul had been teaching. He had not been demanding circumcision before baptism. But we do understand what they're thinking. They had to be circumcised as a part of their Jewish faith. Christianity has roots in Judaism, obviously, and so they're thinking that to become a Christian, you first have to become a Jew. So you have to do what we had to do, is kind of the way they were thinking, if I understand this correctly. Well, Paul goes out and converts people directly out of paganism or whatever they were involved in, and they see Paul as encouraging people to skip a step. And so they're thinking, wait a minute, this isn't right. You're, you're missing a big part of what we need to be teaching and preaching to people. And so uh, these brothers from a Jewish background, they travel to Antioch. And they start teaching that people cannot be saved without being circumcised. In verse 2, we find that Paul and Barnabas don't just give in. They don't just give in to keep the peace. They don't say, oh, well, okay, you believe that, we'll believe this, that kind of thing. But they fight this. And they have great dissension and debate with these men. And so there is some back and forth. There is some arguing that takes place. Now, how frustrating this must have been for Paul to have so many people to reach with the gospel. But he's slowed down by this disagreement. Can you imagine being in Paul's shoes here? He used to be where these men are now. And he's out there teaching people, baptizing, instructing, encouraging, building congregations. And now he's got to deal with this mess. This is not what I signed up for. Uh, this was maybe a little bit unexpected. And so he has to take time to argue over this. Certainly we don't like arguing about things like this in the Lord's Church today. But if something comes in and threatens to disrupt the unity of the congregation, if it's a, uh, a leaving the scripture kind of moment, we need to slow down and we need to tackle that. And so he takes time to argue it. They don't resolve it though. And so the church decides that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others need to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this with the other apostles and the elders there in Jerusalem. Well, with it being a journey of nearly 400 miles, Paul takes full advantage of his time on the road by meeting with God's people along the way. So he's describing the conversion of the Gentiles. So he's basically giving a summary of his first missionary journey over and over again at each church he visits on his way to Jerusalem. And people are thrilled about what they hear. And to me, this seems like almost one more way Paul is fighting back over this teaching that Gentiles need to be circumcised. He's not giving in, but he's going on the offensive here with something of a good news campaign. So he's spreading the good news that Gentiles are now a part of God's kingdom. Kingdom includes Gentiles. That's a huge theme of the book of Acts. In verse 4, they make it to Jerusalem. They do the same thing in Jerusalem. They report all that God has done with them and through them. But once again, when they get to Jerusalem, we find that some Pharisees show up and they repeat their claim that the new converts need to be circumcised. And we do have at least a, a two new pieces of information here. First of all, those who object are Pharisees. I don't know if we knew that before. Maybe we did, but they are the same sect Paul was. I just want to point that out here. Remember, Paul was from this background. And then we also learn that the Pharisees are demanding not only circumcision, but that the new converts observe the law of Moses. And so 
it's not just circumcision, but it is all of it. Okay, so the new converts don't just need to be circumcised, but they need to follow all of the law of Moses. And so this is absolutely huge. In their jealousy, the Pharisees are demanding that Paul make these people Jews. I'm thinking of what Jesus said in Matthew 23, 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Now, that's some pretty rough language there, isn't it? That's some very strong uh, words from Jesus. And so the Pharisees then were all about getting converts. And so they were motivated. They were on fire for God in a sense. And, and here it seems that they are trying to steal Paul's converts. They want to take these people Paul has reached and they want to turn them into full-blown Jewish converts, probably Pharisees. Remember, as I pointed out just a few moments ago, Paul himself had been a leading Pharisee. And so it probably really burned these people that Paul had switched sides. And so they are really upset about this. So let's continue then with Acts 15, verses 6 through 12. Acts 15, verses 6 through 12. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. All the people kept silent, and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles." And so the apostles and the elders, they get together to discuss this. And we learn here, after there had been much debate, Peter speaks up. Obviously, Peter is known for being quite outspoken. He's also known for being pretty concise. And uh, Peter is not one to ramble on. He gets it done. He, very uh, few words. He, he speaks often, but he uses few words when he does. And that's what we see here, as Peter seems to give a pretty good summary of the situation. So he speaks from a position of experience. He speaks from a position of authority. As he refers to himself here, he explains that God chose him, Peter, to be the first one to preach to the Gentiles. That's a reference to Cornelius. He explains that God gave them the Holy Spirit just as he gave it to the apostles. This would be a reference to the miraculous gift of the speaking in tongues. As we learned a few weeks ago from Acts 10 and 11, this wasn't to save them, but this was a sign just as it was for the apostles on the day of Pentecost. Just as the apostles weren't saved on Pentecost, they were saved before that. Uh, but the, the sending of the Spirit in this miraculous way, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, was as a sign. And in verse 9, this sign indicated that there was no distinction between the apostles and the Gentiles. Their hearts were to be cleansed by faith just like us. In verse 10, Peter is incredibly straightforward, isn't he? Accusing the Pharisees of putting God to the test. Don't test me, it seems, that God has said, kind of paraphrasing there a number of situations throughout the Old Testament, but they are testing the Lord. So a serious accusation, pretty much what Stephen accuses them of doing back in Acts chapter 7, that the Jewish leaders are following in the steps of their hard-hearted, uncircumcised in heart and mind kind of forefathers, constantly harassing and killing God's prophets. And that's pretty much what Peter is saying here, that these people are putting God to the test by forcing these new converts to carry a burden that neither we nor our fathers were able to bear. If we require circumcision, then we're forcing them to keep the entire law of Moses. And if we do that, uh, we are making it impossible for these people to ever be saved. Instead, Peter emphasizes that we're saved through the grace of Jesus, just like they are. And really, there's nothing to add to this. And we find that the people are silent. And it's almost like Peter has said what needs to be said. And they seem to agree with this. There's no real, arg there's no real argument at this point. They continue to listen then to what Paul and Barnabas are reporting, that God has done some amazing things among the Gentiles. 
Um, by the way, as far as I know, as far as I can tell, these are the last words of Peter ever recorded for us in the book of Acts. And so at this point, Peter just disappears. He goes off. He does something else. We don't know really much about where Peter went from here. Uh, but the focus from this point forward is getting more and more to be just on Paul. And I just wanted to make a note that we're kind of saying goodbye to Peter here. He's he's fading and, and Paul is coming on the scene and getting stronger. And the rest of the book really will be focused on the Apostle Paul. So let's continue then with Acts 15 verses 13 through 21. Acts 15 verses 13 through 21. After they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. With this, the words of the prophets agree. Just as it is written, after these things I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols, and from fornication, and from what is strangled, and from blood. For Moses, from ancient generations, has in every city those who preach him, since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So James, the Lord's brother, he is the next to speak up. How do we know that this is not James the Apostle? Well, James the Apostle was beheaded, wasn't he, by Herod there in Acts chapter 12. And so this is James, uh, the Lord's half-brother, who seems to be a leader in the church in Jerusalem by this time. And James, when he gets up, he refers back to what Simeon has just said. And it's interesting that James uses what appears to be the Aramaic form of Peter's Hebrew name. So Simon Peter, but Simeon in the Aramaic version of it. And so in other words, he is emphasizing Peter's Jewish heritage in this scenario here. And James takes what Peter has said and he ties it into a passage from the prophet Amos. And so it's basically, let's consult the word of God on this issue. Let's open the manual. This is something you wanna hear uh, when elders, for example, get together to discuss a problem, what does the scripture say about this? And that's what he does. So Amos had predicted the rebuilding of the tabernacle of David and suggested at some point in the future, the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Well, that included Gentiles. And so Gentiles coming to the Lord was predicted by the prophets. And so uh, what he's saying here is the prophets are our authority. They spoke from God. And they predicted from long ago that what we are experiencing right now will happen. And so from our point of view, this is new. This is a new conflict that we're facing here. But God has seen this coming. So James' conclusion then is that we not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. Let's not harass these people. Let's not make it any more difficult than it already is. And he proposes writing a letter. Obviously, there are times when having something in writing helps solve a problem. Uh, there are some benefits to it. The message is consistent, right? It can be repeated. It can be copied word for word. It can be shared from church to church. So the message isn't going to get watered down. It's not going to get changed as it passes from person to person, as it might if it were passed along just by word of mouth. And in this letter, James makes four suggestions that the new Gentile converts abstain from things contaminated by idols, that they abstain from fornication, that is sexual sin, that they abstain from what is strangled, and that they also abstain from blood. And to me, this seems to be something of, uh, I don't want to say compromise in a way that it is, but, but these are the minimum standards to maintain uh, unity between the Jews and the Gentiles. But I just want us to notice what is not on this list. I think what's not on this list is probably more important than what's actually on the list. It's very easy to focus what's on the list, but notice what's not on the list. What do the Gentiles not need to do? Notice circumcision is not required here. He doesn't say Oh, and you also must be circumcised. That's not here. And that's what this whole discussion has been about. Beyond this, we have these four guidelines. 
Uh, one of these, a ban on fornication, obviously that is repeated a number of times elsewhere in the New Testament. Um, but with the others, at least some of them seem to be, I, I want to say somewhat flexible, but that's really not the right word for it either. I mean, um, one kind of is, that kind of puts the other remaining guidelines in question, at least with me. And I'm referring specifically to the food contaminated by idols. So if food contaminated by idols is this rock solid thing that we always need to avoid under all circumstances, we at least need to think about the fact that a little bit later, uh, Paul will argue in 1 Corinthians 8 that we can eat food that's been sacrificed to an idol. So if those things are parallel, that's something we need to consider here. Uh, because we as God's people, if we have knowledge, we know that idols are nothing. So it really shouldn't bother us. However, his point in that passage over in 1 Corinthians was, we might need to restrict our freedom because not all people have this knowledge. Not everybody knows that idols are nothing. And I'm kind of summarizing several passages here, but my understanding is that things contaminated by idols, uh, we need to look at that in its context and uh, consider the circumstances here. If I go to a grocery store and find a steak that's half price because it's been killed and laid at the foot of an idol uh, to Zeus for a few minutes, um, awesome. I just got a great deal on a steak because I know that Zeus is a made-up God and that means nothing. However, if I baptize my formal, formerly idol-worshipping neighbor and have him over for dinner, it might not be wise to have him over for a Zeus steak. I hope that makes sense. It's fine for me, but it's not fine for him. And so in that circumstance, I need to avoid that so as not to cause him grief or make him to stumble. So as I look at these guidelines, um, we've got the rock solid. We know the fornication thing that is to be avoided. We can't do that no matter what. Um, the abstaining from things contaminated by idols, to me that seems to be more in the category of it depends. And and that puts the other two kind of, where are we gonna put those? Are they on the fornication side of things or are they more on the uh, food contaminated by idols kind of side of things? A thing strangled and from blood. And really those two things go together, don't they? Um, it was against God's law and the law of Moses. And really from before the law of Moses, they were not to drink blood or eat blood. And strangling, of course, would leave the blood in the animal. And uh, so those two things kind of go together. So I, I don't know. I'd love to hear what you're thinking on these things. Um, the other side of this is that these prohibitions come from God. And they're binding on all people at all times and all cultures from here on out. And that, that is a possibility. Uh, but what I do know is that in this time and place, in light of the controversy over circumcision, and in light of the thousands of Gentiles obeying the gospel, this is what needs to be communicated. Do not do these four things. And to me, that seems to be aimed at maintaining unity uh, between these two factions. In other words, Gentiles are not to flaunt their freedom, but they need to remember that they are being born into a family with a long history. And you might not want to bring bacon to your first church potluck. Obviously, they don't mention bacon here, but I'm illustrating that it is perhaps somewhat parallel. Um, and this view seems to be supported by verse 21, the reference to Moses being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So they're kind of saying the law is not to be ignored. It's always going to be with us, kind of like we're studying on Sunday morning in our sermon series right now. But circumcision is not to be bound as a religious ritual. It is not necessary for salvation. Circumcision is not in this list of essentials. Well, let's continue tonight with Acts 15, 22 through 29. Acts 15, 22 through 29. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brethren, and they sent this letter by them. The apostles and the brethren who are elders, to the brethren in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, who are from the Gentiles, greetings. Since we have heard that some of our number, to whom we gave no instruction, have disturbed you with their words, unsettling your souls, it seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore we have sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, 
that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you, do, you will do well. Farewell. Well, in the first two verses here, we have the apostles and the elders and the whole church uh, coming together, choosing men to send back up to Antioch along with uh, Paul and Barnabas. Um, and they're to deliver a letter. And what strikes me here is that everybody is now in agreement. So there's no longer a division in this meeting, but they've all come together. They started out divided, but they considered the relevant scriptures and they came to a conclusion. And the conclusion in this letter is to be delivered by four men, Paul, Barnabas, Judas, Barsabbas, and Silas. Well, why write this down? I guess we're getting back to the value of a letter. Why not just have Paul go deliver this message by word of mouth? Hey, they told me to tell you this kind of thing. And I think as we think about that question, it seems that a letter has more weight, doesn't it? Uh, yes, Paul could have said what is about to be written in this letter, but it would be Paul who had baptized multitudes of Gentiles without circumcision, showing up and saying, hey, it's okay to baptize multitudes of Gentiles without circumcision. So he's kind of just affirming it himself. And I guess we could have avoided all of chapter 15 if Paul up in Antioch had said, hey, I'm an apostle, listen to me, we don't need to do circumcision anymore, that's the last word. So I guess I also find it interesting that Paul kind of submitted to being sent back to Jerusalem to settle this thing uh, in a, in a, maybe in a more open way or a way that more people would accept. So kind of getting people in on that conversation. Um, so Paul could have said what was said in this letter. He could have said it face to face, but uh, certainly the letter lets everybody know that the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem are united on this. So we are all together. It's not just Paul who manipulated this thing to get his own way, uh, but this is the entire group, the whole church, all of God's people are together on this at this point. And I think the, the letter uh, emphasizes this. Uh, in the letter itself, notice how they recognize the conflict. In other words, we know how disturbing this has been. Isn't that a valuable thing to say sometimes? I understand your frustration with this thing that's happened, this thing that's going on in the church. And so we hear you. That seems to be what they're saying here. Uh, we know how disturbing this has been. Then they move into what they're doing about it. Okay, we are sending you this letter. We're, we're dealing with this in writing. We're, we're sending a letter along with a personal visit from some men who have risked their lives for you. So it's not something we take lightly, but we're sending them back up there to deliver this in person. And so this is serious to us. This is what we're doing about it, and they make it personal. Letters can be helpful, but it's also helpful to be able to talk to somebody. So I hope we never get to the point in the Lord's Church where we're just like, oh, let's send them a letter and be done with it. There needs to be more to it than that. So it, it's helpful to be able to talk to somebody face-to-face, -to, -face, uh, to be able to ask questions, to see facial expressions, and to be reassured in person. I would also point out in verse 25 that everybody is of one mind. And so they are united in this summary. We are all together on this. Uh, this is not a matter of voting. I would just kind of emphasize that here. It wasn't, uh, you know, when, when we vote, somebody gets left out. Okay, all in favor of this, say aye, nay. Oh, bummer, you lose. That's really not the way we want to deal with things in the church. And another kind of danger there is, on the other end of that, it's easy for some to say, well, that was the church's decision. It wasn't my decision. I got outvoted. Well, that's really never a real healthy thing to say. Uh, in the church, we don't rule by the majority, um, but we're not ruled by the minority either. Instead, our goal is to come to a common understanding of the truth based on Scripture. Uh, so to come to some kind of consensus where we understand the Scriptures together. Uh, I would also emphasize that this plan seemed good to the Holy Spirit. And so God is involved in this. This is not a matter of all in favor of adopting this new doctrine, raise your hand or say aye. That's not what's going on here. They're not changing the doctrine of the church by voting. That's not what's happening. Uh, but rather this plan, this communication of this plan, uh, seemed good to the Holy Spirit. And so God is absolutely involved in this. Remember, this is before they had the written word. Uh, then they give the essentials. They boil it down. These are the four things we just read about in the previous paragraph. So they have bullet points is the way we would say it today. Does it fit well on a PowerPoint? Okay, four things. And notice they do not mention circumcision. Circumcision is not a requirement here. 
And as our summary of this chapter indicates, the old law is not binding. Old law, not binding. Acts 15. All right, let's conclude tonight with Acts 15, verses 30 through 35. Acts 15, 30 through 35. So when they were sent away, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Judas and Silas, also being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. After they had spent time there, they were sent away from the brethren in peace to those who had sent them out. But it seemed good to Silas to remain there. But Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, teaching and preaching with many others also the word of the Lord. In the first part of this, they head up to Antioch. Everybody gets together. They deliver the letter. And it was received quite well, wasn't it? It goes well. Judas and Silas speak for some time. They're prophets. They speak on God's behalf. They have the hotline to God. As I picture the prophet situation, they're speaking forth on God's behalf. And they use that gift to encourage and strengthen the church. They wrap it up, but Silas, Paul, and Barnabas all stay there in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. Um, that brings us to a good place to pause until next week, but it gets us to a point where we have uh, Paul, Barnabas, and Silas all in one place. And that kind of sets us up for what will be known as the second missionary journey introduced in the closing uh, paragraph of Acts 15. And I want to pick up there um, uh, next week. Uh, by the way, though, kind of before we end, I, I just want to mention that we seem to have a parallel account over in Galatians 2. Um, some say it's the same event. Others disagree that it was some other incident at a different time and place, but there are some similarities. And before we close tonight, I just want to uh, point out what Paul writes in Galatians 2, 1 through 10. And listen to the similarities between what Paul writes to the churches of Galatia and what Luke records in Acts 15. Galatians 2, 1 through 10, just briefly here. Paul says, Then after an interval of fourteen years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. It was because of a revelation that I went up, and I submitted to them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but I did so in private to those who were of reputation, for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus in order to bring us into bondage. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me, God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me, but on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, for he who effectually worked for Peter and his apostleship to the circumcised, effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They only asked us to remember the poor, uh, the very thing that I was eager to do. Again, as far as I can tell, this is perhaps Paul's account, Paul's side of the story as to what happens in Acts 15. Obviously, the similarity here is there is a conflict over circumcision, and the church did not yield to those who were trying to push circumcision on the new converts. And the result is that the church is more unified than they were before. That issue is clarified. So whether this is the same event as we just read about in Acts 15, we may never know for certain. Um, but I, I think we do see some similarity. So I guess kind of summarizing again, Acts 15 up to this point, um, we're now to a point where we've got Paul, Barnabas, and Silas all together. So this gets us ready for the second missionary journey. So that'll be a good place for us to pick up next week if the Lord wills. So next week, let's pick up with Acts 1536. We're going to come to the beginning of the second missionary journey. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to study together with us tonight. I hope you can be present for worship at either 9 or 11 this Sunday. And I plan on coming between the uh, two services for the Bible class or the Bible study at 10. We're working on uh, Peter's epistles. So we're working our way through First and Second Peter. You should have a book by now, and I'm looking forward to coming together to study that. Uh, as we close, let's go to God in prayer. 
Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, the, the author of scripture, the source of unity between your people. Tonight, we're thankful for your word and for the guidance that you give to us through it. We pray that you would be with Abe tonight as he recovers. We're thankful that his injuries were not as bad as they could have been. Uh, be with those who are recovering from uh, storms and fire and other natural disasters. It seems like there's so much going on in the world right now. Be with your church as we serve, as we do what we can to help. Be with our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan right now. We pray for their peace. We pray for their safety so that we can worship you unhindered if it's your will. Thank you, Father, for saving us and for making us a part of your plan to go into all the world with the gospel. Help us as we encourage each other. In Jesus we pray. Amen.